guess what's coming up on the program today? The Tonga government describes the recent volcanic eruption which triggered a tsunami as an unprecedented disaster. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson insists he did not lie to MPs about the party held at his office during the COVID-19 lockdown. Plus, more bad news up ahead for tennis superstar Novak Djokovic as the Spanish government says he must get vaccinated to play in the Spanish Open. A warm welcome to the program. I'm Amarachi Ubani. We we'll begin with updates on the situation in Tonga, where a volcanic eruption triggered a tsunami felt as far as New Zealand, Peru and Japan. The government now says the disaster was unprecedented. They have confirmed three deaths so far, two locals and a British national. Tonga's main island bore the brunt of the disaster, but so did surrounding islands. Tonga's small outer island suffered extensive damage from the massive volcanic eruption and tsunami, with an entire village destroyed and many buildings missing, raising fears of more deaths and injuries. Members of the Tongan diaspora fear never seeing their loved ones on the Pacific island again. The worst fear is always that you're not going to see the people that you love again. Um, yeah, that's the worst fear. The worst fear is um, the suffering of other people that's hard to cope with, probably even more than your own suffering. Yeah, I would definitely say that. Our ability to empathize with each other is um, quite massive. When somebody else loses a parent, we all feel it. And the same if, if I was to have any suffering, I'm aware that um, other islanders, other Pacific people, other Tongans all feel exactly my feeling. That's how close we are. The eruption was felt as far away as the US. In Peru, two people drowned in abnormally high waves while beaches near the capital Lima were closed off following an oil spill. The destruction from Tonga's massive underwater volcanic eruption is still being assessed, but scientists now warn that the damage could be long lasting. The volcano has been releasing sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxide, two gases that create acid rain. Uh, as the, the plume rose beyond 20 kilometers, it reached well into the stratosphere. So a lot of that ash and gas will remain within the stratosphere for quite a number of uh, weeks and possibly months and uh, kind of circulate across the globe. Uh, the more immediate impact on Tonga especially was the, uh, the ash fall uh, directly from the, from the cloud which blanketed most of the uh, Tongan landscape in a few centimeters of ash from what has been seen of satellite images. Uh, and that basically had an impact on uh, uh, basically water, uh, drinking water sources, on vegetation, grazing for animals, etc. Uh, because the volcanic ash is toxic. And it may not just be Tonga, much of the rain could land on Fiji, underwater, fish are at risk. Tonga's livelihoods depend on the ocean, but ash from the eruption could be harmful to marine life. Even before the eruption, Tonga's reefs were threatened by disease outbreaks and the effects of climate change, including coral bleaching and increasingly strong cyclones. Let's talk some more now about the impact on the environment. Environmentalist Olumide Duwu joins me now on the program. Olumide, thank you for making time to be with us today. Now, I know Tonga does seem far away, uh, but you, you can't deny that there must be some impact the ash spewed could have on the environment and the ecosystem. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's so um, very um, sorry for the issue that is happening in Tonga. But I would say one of the biggest issues that is going to be affecting a lot of people is the fishermen. You know, the fish are going to be affected. And this is one of the greatest uh, issue when it comes to the, uh, the ocean and it comes to uh, the, the people. And with all this, we'll be able to understand that uh, disruption of fishes is going to continue to happen because we don't know how much impact this has already done to people. But I would just say that uh, the environmental impact on the people on the uh, uh, the coastal line of this place is very very you know uh, uh, alarming that we need to start looking at a sustainable way to solve this solution because uh, it's, it, it, we, we people don't see it as human impacts now 
we are seeing it as something that if we have already made a preparation, then such thing will have not happen. So uh, that this is another reason for us to take climate change as a serious topic in our end. Thank you. Well, this is a natural disaster. I don't know what prepares anyone for it, but I do understand that volcanic ash is difficult to clean up. It's also costly. So in the long run, how long do you think before you know, the real impact is being felt on individuals living in the area. You talked about the impact on the ocean, on ocean life. Uh, fish will be affected. Uh, sea life will be disrupted for a really long time. But what about the people themselves? How much of an impact will this have on them? Yeah, thank you very much. I think uh, one of the major impacts on people now is going to be the air quality. And I think uh, the government and the people of uh, Tonga should start looking at the air quality treatment, and because it's one of the biggest issues that they will be facing as time goes on. Air quality and indoor air quality, those are the things that is going to be one of the greatest impacts when it comes to environmental issues. And I will also say that uh, the earlier they do this, and the better for them, because we don't know how much impact this is going to cause. This is the biggest pollution that we are seeing that can affect human and the people on the globe. Well, it, wasn't, it was only a few months ago, you know, that uh, another volcanic eruption uh, was recorded somewhere, you know, off one of those islands of Spain. But in this case of Tonga, uh, can the nation still thrive despite this disaster? Uh, because cleaning up, of course, would take a while. But you're looking at the impact also on neighboring countries. Um, we're hearing, you know, the impact was felt as far as the United States and New Zealand has tried, you know, to get some supplies in and all of that. Do uh, you think that they can recover from this? Yeah, it's possible with the effort and the support of every, let me say, individual institutions, uh, they will re they are going to survive it because uh, we've heard about the tsunami that happened in Japan one time like that. And today, most of them are recovering and they are getting better. So I think the focus now is how we can come together as one, as, uh, as the people, so that we can solve or we can support these people with humanitarian uh, support. And the United Nations uh, Humanitarian uh, Office also need to look at how they can put resources together, both from neighboring countries, uh, uh, developed countries, and to see how they can support these people because these are the time they need support technically, morally, and even uh, with uh, AIDS, they need all those supports. But I will tell you that if only uh, uh, we can come together and collaborate with them, to help them to come back and build back better, then I think that's the only way that we can see this uh, uh, coming back. It's a gradual process and it's a continuous process for the country to see that everybody that is open uh, uh, to support, they will surely get the support. Yeah, that will also be a little difficult. Uh, the Tonga government had said uh, yesterday they were concerned about um, you know people the the humanitarian efforts uh, actually introducing coronavirus to the uh, Pacific Island nation. Olumide Idowu, thank you for speaking with us. Thank you very much. A part of western and southern Johannesburg in South Africa experienced an earthquake in the early hours of today. The earth tremor registered a 3.3 on the local magnitude scale, as recorded by the SA Seismograph Network. Residents took to social media to express what they felt, and there have been no reports of damage to property. The Council for Geoscience says the magnitude recorded is not a cause for concern and that the tremor was likely caused by mining activities in the area opposed to a shift in tectonic plates. Politics in the UK now. A Prime Minister, a Prime Minister Boris Johnson denies an accusation by his former advisor, Dominic Cummings, uh, that he had lied to Parliament about a lockdown party, saying no one had warned him the bring your own booze gathering might contravene COVID-19 rules. Mr. Johnson is facing the gravest crisis of his tenure after revelations about gatherings during the lockdown, some when Britons could not even bid farewell in person to dying relatives and the Queen was mourning her husband. No, nobody told me that what we were doing was, as you say, uh, against the rules, uh, that the event in question was something that we were going to do something that wasn't a work event. And, you know, as I said in the House of Commons, um, uh, when I went out into that garden, I, I thought that I was attending a, a work event. No, Beth, but I want to, I want to begin by 
uh, repeating my apologies to everybody for the misjudgments that I've made, that we may have made in Number 10 and, and beyond, uh, whether in Downing Street or, or throughout the, the pandemic. And I, I do know how infuriating it must be uh, for people up and down the country in view of the, the huge sacrifices that people have, have made, the way that they've kept discipline, uh, the way they've followed the rules, followed the guidance, done the right thing, uh, to think that uh, that didn't happen in, in Number 10 Downing Street. Well, senior civil servant Sue Gray's investigation about a dozen allegations of rule breaking by Mr. Johnson, his team, and officials at Number 10 Downing Street. Senior ministers say people need to wait for the conclusion of her inquiry. Well, no one is more firmly in the Prime Minister's corner than the country's finance minister, Rishi Sunak. Sunak believes the Prime Minister's explanation over the party at Number 10. Of course I do. The Prime Minister you set out. The truth. Of course I do. The Prime Minister set out his understanding of this matter in Parliament last week, and I'd refer you to his words. As you know, Sue Gray is conducting an inquiry into this matter, and I fully support the Prime Minister's request for patience while that inquiry concludes. Well, I'm not going to get into hypotheticals. The ministerial code is is clear on these matters, but as you know, Sue Gray is conducting an inquiry into the situation. I think it's right that we allow her to conclude that job. And well, what you saw in today's figures was that wages grew at just over 4% for the three months to November. That's relatively healthy by historical standards. But of course, we are seeing challenges with inflation. It's important to remember that we're not alone in that. This is a global phenomenon because the, the causes of inflation, whether it's supply chains or energy prices, are, of course, global in nature. But we are taking action to support people best we can. That's we mentioned it briefly of Johnson's former aide Dominic Cummings said the Prime Minister was told about the party in advance. British media have reported that at least 11 gatherings took place at PM's office and residence or in other government departments between May 2020 and April 2021 when COVID-19 rules limited how, people, how many people could meet socially. Solve the problem, but keep in mind that They believe cyber attacks like the one Ukraine suffered last week could be carried out. Western countries say they fear Russia is preparing a pretext for a new assault on Ukraine, which it invaded in 2014. Russia has denied any plans for an attack, but says it could take unspecified military action unless the West agrees to a list of demands, including banning Ukraine from ever joining NATO. So we are continue working on preparation of sanctions, just in case. Although uh, the intelligence information that we have uh, makes us to believe that as far as the negotiation continues, and as far as the military deployment of Russia is not being completed, because it's not yet being completed, the possibility of a massive attack against Ukraine is not the most uh, probable scenario. There are other ways of attacking, like the cyber attacks, like the one that the Ukrainian government suffered on a certain number of their website. EU's foreign policy chief, Josep Borrell. On the other hand, the UK Defence Secretary Ben Wallace says the country is supplying Ukraine with short-range anti-tank missiles for self-defence. Wallace says a small team of British troops would be sent to Ukraine to provide training as well as there is, uh, as, because there is legitimate and real concern that Russian troops could be used for an invasion. Still ahead on The World Today. Well, volunteer showcases uh, Chinese carving as uh, Beijing prepares to host the Winter Olympics. Stay with us. Welcome back. Australia today recorded its deadliest day of the coronavirus pandemic with a total of 77 deaths, up from the previous national high of 57 on Thursday last week. A country is dealing with its worst COVID-19 outbreak fueled by the Omicron variant, 
variant uh, which has put people in hospitals and in intensive care. There's more the situation from around the world. Global update continues with China's mainland administering more than 2.94 billion COVID-19 vaccine doses as of Monday. According to data released by the National Health Commission, the mainland has reported 171 new COVID-19 cases on Monday, including 127 locally transmitted and 44 imported cases. In the UK, the health authorities are optimistic that the COVID-19 measures introduced to reduce the spread of Omicron will be scaled back next week as cases and hospitalizations look to have peaked. Prime Minister Boris Johnson introduced the so-called Plan B measure for England in December in a bid to slow the spread of Omicron. The measures, which include advice to work from home where possible, greater mask wearing and the use of vaccine passes, are due to be reviewed on January 25th. The action that this government has taken in response to Omicron and the collective efforts of the British people have seen us become the most boosted country in Europe, the most tested country in Europe and the most antivirals per head in Europe. Israel is continuing to offer a fourth COVID-19 vaccine shot, despite preliminary findings that it's not enough to prevent Omicron infections. A preliminary study published by the country's Sheba Medical Center on Monday found that the fourth shot increased antibodies to even higher levels than the third, but it's probably not enough to stop the highly transmissible Omicron variant. Israel was the fastest country to rule out vaccinations a year ago. Finally, the cumulative total of confirmed COVID-19 cases in the United States exceeded 66 million on Monday, with the death toll surpassing 851,000. That's according to the Center for System Science and Engineering at Johns Hopkins University. U.S. Business Insider reported on Sunday, citing data from the Department of Health and Human Services, that since the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention shortened quarantine period for health workers diagnosed with COVID-19 in epidemic prevention guidelines last month. The number of cases of newly infected in hospitals surged in a short period of time. more now about the hostage situation that occurred at a Texas synagogue over the weekend. The British man who took four people hostage had been investigated by MI5. 44-year-old Malik Faisal Akram from Blackburn in Lancashire was the subject of investigation in late 2020, but by the time he flew to the US, it was assessed to be no longer a risk. The four people held hostage at the synagogue in Colleville near Dallas were eventually freed unharmed after a 10-hour siege. Akram was shot dead by police. He had been on the British Security Services watch list as a subject of interest in 2020 and was investigated in the second half of that year. But by 2021, Akram, who had a criminal record in the UK, had moved from the active list to the former subject of interest list and was no longer considered a threat. The World Economic Forum begins today in Davos. This year's edition is a hybrid event, saving billions of dollars in travel for leaders around the world. Earlier today, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres called on the world to stand together to make 2022 a true moment of recovery. Addressing the forum in Davos, Guterres urged all participants to focus on three urgent areas, vaccine inequity, global financial system, and climate action in developing countries. The world is emerging from the depths of a paralyzing economic crisis, but recovery remains fragile and uneven amid the lingering pandemic, persistent labor market challenges, ongoing supply chain disruptions, rising inflation, and looming debt traps, not to mention the geopolitical divide. The last two years have demonstrated a simple but brutal truth. If we leave anyone behind, in the end, we leave everyone behind. If we fail to vaccinate every person, we give rise to new variants that spread across borders and bring daily life and economies to a grinding halt. 
One of newcomer, Israel's Prime Minister Naftali Bennett, warns that funding Iran could lead to what he calls terror on steroids. His speech to the World Economic Forum came as an apparent warning against world power, easing sanctions against Tehran as they seek a new nuclear deal. So I believe Israel now is one of the leading testers per capita. We have about uh, almost 5% of our population uh, is tested every day right now. That's a huge number. 450,000 people go through uh, a test every day. And that's why the, the case numbers are so high, not because necessarily so many people are infected, simply because we test more. By doing these tests, we can uh, isolate folks and, and slow down uh, the, the pace of uh, the infection. To apologize, he was talking there about the coronavirus uh, con virus containment in Israel. A Maltese lawmaker, Roberta Metzola, has secured overwhelming support to become president of the European Parliament, making her the first woman in the post for 20 years. Metzola succeeds Italian socialist David Sassoli in the most ceremonial role presiding over the 705-member parliament of the European Union after he died this month at the age of 65. The 43-year-old defeated two other female candidates, securing 458 of the 616 validly cast votes in the first round, meaning no runoff rounds. Normal practice for the presidency election were required. A member of the European Parliament since 2013, Matsola campaigned as a student for Malta to become a member of the EU. A parliament which adopts and amends legislative proposals and decides on the EU budget has had only two female presidents, Simone Veil and more recently Nicole Fontaine, both French, since it became a directly elected assembly in 1979. Tennis superstar Novak Djokovic has missed this year's Australian Open and may very well be missing the Spanish Open because of his stance on vaccination. The Spanish government says he needs to get vaccinated before being allowed to compete in Spain. Under current rules, however, Djokovic is eligible to participate in the Madrid tournament set to kick off in late April. Unlike France or Australia, Spain does not require travellers to be fully vaccinated to enter the country. If they're not, they must present a negative COVID test taken within 72 hours of their arrival or certify they have had the coronavirus 11 to 180 days before entering Spain. Even though vaccination is not mandatory in Spain, the vaccination rate is one of the highest in Europe. When it serves, it still hurts the national uh, that Novak Djokovic will not be playing in the Australian Open. The world's top-rated men's tennis player, returned to his native Serbia, where he received a rapturous welcome on Monday. Some Belgrade residents, however, pleased to have him back home. I think that he will use these two weeks to decompress, to maybe reflect on some things. Uh, he stated very clearly that he won't be speaking again publicly until Australian Open is over. After that, I expect him uh, some sort of statement or a press conference or an interview, something like that, to explain his position and tell us his impressions about everything uh, he went through, this whole ordeal he went through in Australia. So uh, I, I think that he is relieved that at least everything is over although he is not playing the Australian Open, chasing his 10th title, which was obviously his hope. Uh, it, it wasn't a good showing for anybody. You know, for Australia, it didn't, uh, uh, there, is a, there is not anything good that has come out of this for Australia, for Novak or for anyone involved. As Beijing prepares to host the Winter Olympics, volunteer Du Zaki hopes to showcase traditional Chinese carvings to visitors around the world as she transforms simple oranges into artwork. Unbelievable. Sculpting food has been a part of Chinese culture for hundreds of years, according to the China Culture website, and is often used to create pieces of fruit or vegetables into flowers or birds. Now, Du has carved a number of items into food, including the Olympic rings logo and the Chinese character for winter, her latest piece showcases Bing Duen Duen, a panda wearing a suit of ice who is the mascot for this year's games. That's the world today. Thanks for watching. I'm Amarachi Ubani.